to find the song on the computer there. So he, he was hard at work, making sure the stream and everything goes through properly. So in a minute, Brother Phil will put the lyrics on the screen so everyone could just follow along with us. And we're gonna, we're gonna sing it acapella, all right? So we're gonna need everyone's voices to protrude very loud and very clear. Everyone, please stand. One, two, three, four. Go tell it on the mountains, over the hill and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountains that Jesus Christ is born. When I was a seeker, I sought for night and day. I asked the Lord to help me. And he showed me the way. Go tell it on the mountains, over the hill and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. He made me a watchman. Upon the city wall. Now, if I am a Christian, I am the least of all. Go tell it on the mountains, over the hills, and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. So I like the way we sung that there. So we're going to sing one more before we get started, because this is youth hour. And because this is youth hour, we need energy. All right. We need some energy. I like the energy that was just given there. So we have one more. So thank you, Brother Philip, for pulling those lyrics up. The next thing we have is just a closer walk with thee. And that is in the songbook. That is and number 73 in the songbook. All right, so we're just waiting for the lyrics here to load up and then we're gonna get started. So everyone, one, two, three, go. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Then walking close to thee, let it be still, Lord. Let I wake. But thou art strong. Jesus keeps me from all harm. I'll be fine as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. Ooh, this world of toil and sin. If I walk the Lord who cares, who will be my birthday today? None but me, dear Lord. None but thee. Thank you. Let us open the meeting in a word of prayer. Lord God Almighty, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to have a hall that we can all come together and gather from wherever we are in this world and also a platform that we can sign in wherever we are to give praise and worship to you. For this youth hour, we know that a child is considered to be 100 years old also. To you. So we pray that although the, the simplicity of the words may seem that we can still take it and be able to use it as lessons in this world. We pray for humbleness, we pray for peace, we pray for joy, 
We pray that you'll bless this youth hour and bless the proceedings and those who have stayed and those who may think about staying that you bring them back here. We pray this to your son, to Jesus Christ, Lord and Master. Amen. Please be seated as we have a quick reading. Starting at verse 24, all the way to verse 40, we will be reading Matthew 22. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and rise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren. And the first, when he had married a wife deceased and having no issue left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore in the resurrections, whose wife shall be, she be of the seven for they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrections, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God? Saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. But when the Pharisee that heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with thy and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. While well, the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He said unto them, how then does David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto, the Lord, unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Now this time we'll have our talk by Brother Nigel. Wow. Loving ourselves and others the way God made us. Brother Nigel. What a pleasant good evening to you young people. I see there's a lot of, I mean, all the faces are here are young and they're all welcomed. See Brother David and Brother, <laughs> Brother Tyrone and Brother Rudy. So uh, we just want to top in on this topic on loving ourselves, particularly for the young people, really, uh, the way God, the way God made us. And so what I want to do is to commence by making a very bold statement to you young folks, young people today. One of the most important relationships in life is that of with yourselves. Singleness is the foundation of all relationships. All relationships, the foundation of all relationships between you and your boss, between students and teachers, between parents and children, citizens and politicians, friends, colleagues, and all other relationships that are intimate, like even that of marriage. 
your singleness is the foundation of all those type relationships. How you get along with each other determines in some measure one's singleness. Singleness determines the quality of your relationship personally, socially, professionally, and most important, spiritually. If you're having problems, wherever you might be, whether at home, whether at school, get along with people, it could be a singleness problem. Always seeking attention, always having fights for young people. Problems, it's a sign that you might be suffering from a singleness problem. And so what I'd like to say to you today is that the most important relationship in life generally is not your interpersonal relationship, but rather your intrapersonal relationship. Most of us focus in life, get along with other people, which is not bad in and of itself, providing we fully understand who we are, where we came from, where we're going as an individual. In fact, this is why so many people today, you hear of such things as singles, bars, and singles, dance, and singles, boat rides, and such things. Everyone is trying to go to these places so that they can get along with someone else other than themselves or find someone else. And I want to suggest to you that that is not your priority in life in the area of relationships. Your most important relationship, apart from that of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is not your interpersonal relationship, but rather your intrapersonal relationship. What's the difference? Well, interpersonal relationships is our social associations, connections or affiliations between two or more people. In other words, this is a relationship between you and someone else or others. Your intrapersonal relationship, however, is an association, a connection, an affiliation with oneself. In other words, intrapersonal relationships has to do with self-concept, self-perception, and self-expectations. That's what it has to do with. And your first and foremost relationship you should develop is not with other people, but rather with yourselves. Why is intrapersonal relationship so important? Relationship with oneself. Why is that so important, particularly for you young people? Why is it? Well, the most important person you should desire to know is not other people, but yourselves. The average person on this planet knows very little about the truth of themselves and keep putting on other people's images and other people's personalities. We live other people's expectations and allow society to create what and who we become. So instead of having self-concept, we have an other concept, if you will, which means we have a picture of what other people want us to look like. And that's very important for us young people. Why again, interpersonal relationship is important because self-knowledge is the key of all relationships. And that includes knowledge of your strengths and of your weaknesses. You have to know the areas of your life where you're strong, where you're weak, what you need to work on. You have got to spend time learning about you as an individual and knowing exactly who you are, where you came from, what's my purpose in life, why am I here? And you've got to be in tune as young people to understand that about you as an 
individual. And that is why that relationship is vitally important in our lives. And the third reason is that the most important person for you to love apart from God and the Lord Jesus Christ is not others. And that's not wrong to do that, but the most important, but it's you. And of these three reasons I share with you today of why intrapersonal relationships are of utmost importance to us, I consider this the most important as it is also our topic of consideration this afternoon. The most important person for you to love is you, apart from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, of course. And I'd like to demonstrate this with a, the verse that was read for us by our brother David in Matthew chapter 22. Jesus had this conversation in Matthew 22 from verse 36 to 40. The Pharisees came and said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so in this portion of scripture, Jesus was asked a question by someone. But for us to understand the question, we've got to understand who was talking. And the person asking the question was a Pharisee. And a Pharisee is a member of the ancient Jewish sect who paid very strict observance to the traditional and written laws in the Old Testament. They were trained in all the laws of Moses. And there were an approximation of about 600 plus laws that the Pharisees tried to obey. They studied the Old Testament intensely, especially the first five books called the Pentateuch. And they extracted from there every single law and they wanted to obey them so that they could be most righteous before God. Now 600 plus laws are quite a lot of laws to remember, much more to obey. But one of those Pharisees came to Jesus and asked a very important question and probably the kind of question that you and I may want or ask also. So having met Jesus, he asked him, out of all these laws, which of these is the greatest to keep? In other words, I'm going to keep, if I'm going to keep one law more than all the others, which one is the most important? to keep before God. And Jesus, Jesus' answer sort of blew their mind. Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. But then he also said something that the man didn't ask. The man asked him for one answer, but he went on to give him two answers. Why? because he couldn't answer the question with just one answer. The second answer was of equal importance in this case. Just like unto the first, he said, it is connected to the first. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. A lot of us find it easy to say we love God and that's quite fine. But what of the second part? We all ought to love God first and foremost, unquestionably. Loving your neighbor as yourself. Then he wanted, went on to say that all the other laws are incorporated, if you will, into this one law. In other words, if you keep this one law, you don't need the others. Love God, love yourself, love your neighbor. Not very carefully, young people. Jesus did not say, Love your neighbor first. And that's where many of us at times keep making the mistakes in life. We keep trying to love people without the prerequisites of first loving self. Loving God means to pursue him and focus on his character. As we've learned even from our class early today, to be like him, focus on that character of God, his nature, his qualities. When you love someone, 
You want to pursue them, don't we? You want to understand uh, them. You want to get to know them, to be with them, to know how they think, to know what they want, their needs, their desires are. And Jesus says, do that, all of that for God with all your might. But after you've done that, pursue your neighbor as yourself. Very important. Pursue your neighbor as yourself. And here are the words that are used here in the original Greek. To the same degree as yourself. Or in the same manner as yourself. And that's the idea. Love your neighbor to the same degree with which you love yourself. In other words, the same measure that you love yourself is how you will love others. And that's why intrapersonal relationship is important. Loving God should result in self-love and then self-love qualifies you to love others because you understand who you are, where you come from, what's my life all about, what's my purpose in life. And you're in tune with oneself and understand who you are as an individual. I might put this another way. You can only love others to the same degree and measure with which you love yourself. I'm going to over again. You can only love others to the same degree and measure with which you love yourself. If you don't love yourself, then you need people to love you. And when you don't, when, when they don't love you, the whole bottom sort of falls out, don't it? Because you don't feel love anymore as a person because others don't love me. But if I love me and you don't love me, I am still loved. Right? If I love me and you don't love me, I am still loved because I've learned to love me. So you, if you keep your love from me, I'm still satisfied as an individual. I love me before I met you. So if you leave me, I still love me. Loving God is first and foremost. But when we love ourselves, we understand who we are as an individual, as a person. We understand our relationship in this world and more importantly, our relationship with God. Nothing else matters. And so what Christ is saying is very transparent. Fall in love with yourself first, and that's enough. Because the same measure or degree with which you love self is the only measure with which you can love other people. And that brings me to a very important point. It is more important to love me, love God first, love me, and then love others. Here are some ways in which ways we can love ourselves and what self-love brings about in our lives. When we learn to love self, what does that mean for us as an individual when we love self? Self-love is a result of self-discovery. You have to discover yourself first. If not, you'll never love yourself. Who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Are all important questions for us to ask as an individual in this world. Shouldn't we, Stephen? Very good. Self-love is as a result, result of self-source. And what I mean by that, is you have to discover where yourself was sourced. That is, 
where did you come from? You can't love yourself if you don't know where you came from because source determines value. For example, if I took a piece of rock and I cut it in half, does it become anything else? Absolutely not. And if I cut it again, what it becomes, it's still a rock. So whatever it was originally, no matter how I break it down, it is what it is. The same goes for a piece of diamond, irrespective to how many times I cut it. It maintains its value. So if you don't know your source, it therefore follows that you do not know your value. Where did I come from? That's your value. Self-love also is a result of self-worth. You can never give yourself worth if you don't know where you came from. And you can't know where you came from if you don't discover yourself. And if you don't discover your source. In other words, when we don't understand our value, you are suffering from other people's value of you. And that's why you need them to keep giving you value in your life. Or sometimes we try to create value by the things we collect in life. That's why the fashion industry controls people because you keep trying to buy things to give yourself value because you don't know how much you're worth as an individual. And this is why many people dress with fancy brand name stuff, right? And parts of expensive shoes and expensive clothes because the whole concept has to do with lack of self-worth. And we've gotta be careful about that as young people. We are valuable individuals, all of us, and we've gotta understand that. Self-love also is a result of self-esteem. Esteem means how much do you estimate or cost you cost, similar to worth almost. What is the estimate of yourself? For some people, it is so low, they sell themselves on the streets, and that's called prostitution. Sometimes people sell themselves sophisticatedly in their jobs or even sell themselves in a relationship that they know they shouldn't go that low with, but went nonetheless, because they don't have an, any estimation of their true value. And so they sell themselves cheap on the altar of compromise. You shouldn't marry anybody to make you feel important. Forget it. When you realize how much you're worth, you fall in love with yourself. Self-love also is a result of self-concept. Concept means idea or picture of myself. How do you picture yourself determines how you treat yourself. And that picture comes from your discovery of yourself. A diamond, you would, I'm sure you've heard the term before, is a diamond, is a diamond, is a diamond. A rose is a rose is a rose. In other words, whatever a thing is, that's what it is. Your picture of yourself, therefore, doesn't come from other people. You look nice today. That's good. But I don't necessarily need you to tell me that I look nice today. I was creating the image and likeness of Almighty God. Besides, I also knew that before I left the house today. I knew that before I left the house today. Jesus Christ never in his life needed someone's endorsement on who he was in life. And that's important young folks, young people for us to understand, right? He often used the words throughout scriptures over and over again, I, referring to himself on countless occasions because there's nothing that anyone could tell him about himself that he didn't already know about himself because he spent the time to learn exactly who he was as an individual. He took the time, young people, to learn about himself and create the best interpersonal relationship with himself. And so every so often throughout scripture, you'll hear him say, I am 
the bread of life. I am the word of life. I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the resurrection. I am the good shepherd. That's why I don't need your opinion. He never spoke negatively about himself. He never accepted anyone's opinions on himself because when you have a sense of self concept, other people's opinions can't touch you. If you don't know who you are, others will tell you who you should be. And we've got to be very careful of that, young people. Learn about yourselves. Self-love is a result of self-identity. When you know who you are, it becomes very easy to identify with that portion. Today, however, we have Hollywood telling us who we should identify with and what we should look like. It's a total insult as far as I'm concerned and utter embarrassment and disrespect to God for man to have any say in his creation. We dare not go to a manufacturer and tell him what he should do or how he should design his car. God created us in his image after his likeness. Who are we to determine what's the standard of beautiful? We all are created in the image and likeness of almighty God. That being said, I want us to look at some characteristics of self-love. Self-love brings about in us self-confidence, a feeling of trust in one's abilities or qualities and judgment, okay? Like David and Goliath, he was confident in who he was as an individual. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine to defy the armies of the living God? He was confident in who he was. He learned about himself and he built the right and proper relationship with Almighty God. Nothing can touch you, young people. Another characteristic of self love is self respect. And self respect is a feeling that one is behaving with honor and dignity. If you believe that you're a diamond, you put yourself in any situation. You don't put yourself in any type of situation, go with anybody in your life. Wearing anything, you ought to respect yourself when you love yourself because you know what you're worth. Another characteristic of self-love is self-assertiveness. When a person has love for themselves, they assert themselves, which means they believe they have something to offer and are willing and eager to do so. That can be advice, it can be input, whatever it is. And people look at you in the same way. Self-motivation, another characteristic. When a person is driven by their own desires and ambitions, they don't depend on other people to get them going. When you are motivated, self-motivated, you manage your own feelings. You decide what you want every morning by yourself, with yourself, for yourself. Like building the right and proper relationship with or Heavenly Father, in prayers and daily Bible readings. No one else has to tell you to do that. You wake up and you do it. You're motivated to do it because you know who you are. Another characteristic of self-love is self-giving. The ability to give yourself to somebody else without expecting anything back. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was the master of that. What Paul writes, for scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet for a good man some would even dare to die. But Christ, while we were sinners, gave himself to us. He don't want anything back. There's nothing that we can give back to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in that sense. But he gave it because he knew who he was. Another characteristic we want to look at is self-affirmation the recognition and assertion of the existence and value you place on yourself. For you're bought with a price, Paul writes. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's, right? 
self-affirmation. And finally, the final last characteristic I, I'd like to look at for, uh, of self-love is self-investing. The investing and contributing of time in oneself towards a specific goal or purpose in life. David wrote, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now, many in this picture look a little differently, but here we are today, right? We've grown up, right? The way God made us, right? Uh, and I think that everyone there, especially the one in the red tie, is a very handsome young man, isn't he? Right? <laughs> I, 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 the others are too, but, uh, and, and you know, it, it's a wonderful family, yeah? aren't, aren't, isn't that true? Look at it, the way God made us. Right? We don't need anybody else's estimation on what and who we are. It's all of who created us. Right? And so I'd like to take our minds back to creation for just a moment. God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And he created God in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And what the record says, God blessed them. Be fruitful and multiply. You are a blessing, young people. God has created you, Stephen. God has created you, young man. You believe that? Are you a handsome young man? Absolutely, right? Both without and within. And Joseph's three sons as well. I can't remember your names, but you all are wonderful young men. All right. The Hebrew root word has the idea of image for image is resemblance. Some of us are tall. Some of us are short. Some of us are dark. Some of us are light. It doesn't matter. With all these different shades, stature and complexion, heights and sizes, the most important thing for us to know is that our heavenly father created us all for his greater plan and his greater purpose. And everything that he made was very good. That means you and I, okay? It's just saddening. The cosmetic industry today, where people are trying to look like someone else. It's over a six to seven billion dollars industry today to affect their outward appearances that the world might embrace and accept who they are. God created you. And he created you very good. In his image. After his likeness. We don't need anything else. Why are we allowing the world's standards. To measure what we should look like. Why do we need our society to tell us. Whether we're beautiful or not. Whether we're handsome or not. Right. That's the industry in the world we live in today. And as young people. We must caution ourselves against those things, right? And all throughout the world, it is, it, it is almost uh, brainwashed to the minds and hearts of young people. And they're chasing after all of these things to look like somebody else. And so we have magazines like that. It's not up there, but I've got it on my screen, right? What the world wants us to be like and look like, right? Sexiest men alive. And that's the definition of beautiful and wonderful, right? That's what the world wants us to look like, folks. And it's all about the outward appearance and it's all about how we look in the eyes of somebody else. But how do we look in the eyes of Almighty God? God is not concerned about our outward appearances. He made us beautiful, irrespective of who we are. And we remember the occasion when he sent Samuel onto the house of Jesse to choose from him a son from amongst them. And the first son, Eliab, went by. And the Lord said, look not on his countenance or on his stature, for I 
have not chosen him. I have refused him. Why? For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance. And where does God look? Upon our hearts. And so when we have learned to love us, love ourselves, love God first and love ourselves, we have a definition of what true beauty is because we strive to be like him. We strive to reflect his image in our lives, his character in our lives. And that's the definition of what's beautiful today, young people. Not what the world tells us and not how the world defines beauty. It's how God defines it in us. And God created this world beautifully with everything that was there for a specific reason and for a specific purpose. And we are privileged to be a part of God's world. And we all are beautiful in his sight. Don't let anyone else's estimation of you determine what you try to look like or who you try to be as an individual. God has made his estimation of who you are in his life, who I am in his life. Learn to love ourselves. And then we'll be able to love others to the same degree with which we have loved ourselves. Let the noises of the world stay exactly where it is. Don't let it infiltrate your hearts and your minds. And so you go on in life trying to be somebody else. If you're going to be anybody else in life, be like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Learn to love you, young people. Learn to understand who you are as a person, as an individual, and live your life. Not thinking of what others have to say about you and how others feel about you but how God feels and thinks about you as a person. That's the only person estimation of you that should matter. And he says, you are beautiful. You are wonderful. And so may God continue to be with you all, rest in your hearts and minds, and you grow up to be self-confident as an individual and live your lives truly to the honor and glory of Almighty God. I'll stop there. At this time, we have any questions or comments that you may have, feel free to ask. ask. Just raise your hand. Don't be scared. And this is not just like, this is like experiences. You can talk about your experiences at work when you had to deal with these things. At, my bad. At school. <laughs> at school when you had to deal with these things, all these problems that happen, like we talk at Youth Circle. When you, nah, they're too scared to tell the stories now. They're like, it's too much eyes, too much ears. But it's a powerful talk, self-love, right? And that's a powerful thing. If you don't know who you are, you let anybody do whatever, you know? And that's yeah, a, whatever. Yeah. Yes, Angelica, Sister Angelica. Comment. One second, one second. We get the, um, yeah. have a comment and uh, just for the young people, prior to leaving the comfort of your home with your parents, a lot of these messages are rarely challenged. I know the young people here and who your parents are, and I know that they're feeding you these positive messages of self-confidence. But once you have left home, whether you're going off to college or some other adventure, that's really when a lot of those messages come in so it may seem like yeah I hear this a lot and that's good because after you leave home once the world starts to get in more into your life whether with work other activities that's really where you're going to start hearing and seeing a lot of people who don't have that message who were not raised in a place where people were 
loving, where people poured into them, where people told them positively every day that they are worth something, okay? And those people have a, they can have a chance to mess things up for, for you or other people. And that's kind of why it's very important that you hear this and you remember this, because I know a lot of y'all are creeping up to the late teens somehow. Um, and that's when you're gonna wanna remember, like you have something to live for. You have a purpose here. You have been loved and you are loved. They say that um, school school gives you the, the lesson, then the test, but life gives you the test and then you learn your lesson. <laughs> So it's, you know, that, that, that really stood out to me a lot more. Um, and that's an amazing, that's an amazing thing that Angelica said. Um, you guys can't really grasp it right now, I would say, but for those of you, and you're now going into college, you're about to go into college next year. You know what I mean? And you guys aren't young anymore. So all these things, you know, just, I know, um, brother Nigel. Yep. Yeah. And there's all kinds of noises that's coming at you. Yep. And, and, and people kind of pressure you into a certain mold that you should be and do what they want you to do. Where do you stand when that happens? And I can I can vividly remember those ages in my life. It's been a long time ago, but I vividly remember them. And, and I remember on every occasion, I've learned to stand my foot in the ground and say to God. I, I really have. I, I, I've given my life over to God when I was 21 years old. I've got baptized into the saving name. I've never looked back. And it's been 32 years. Ago. And it's been a great and tremendous blessing. And I never let anyone else determine what I should be or could be. But right? I've always built a right and proper relationship with God first and then with myself. Right? And I could remember... Uh, it was uh, a, a few years uh, after I migrated to the United States. I was just married. I was in my early 20s. And, you know, sometimes you have young friends in life that, uh, that you can't wait to see them when you, I know he migrated. I said, I can't wait to see this guy, man. We, we, we did, you know, some things when we were young together back home in Guyana. So I came up here and I, I asked everybody in the planet for his number. I finally got a hold of him, man. I was so excited to talk to this guy. When I got on the phone with him, and we asked how we doing, he says, man, what's going on in your life? So I said, man, you know, when I married here, I've got my wife and so forth. And he turned to me and said, man, you married with all these curatils around here? That was the last time I talked to that guy. That was the last time I had any conversation. With him. I said, brother, have a nice day. And that was the end of it. And that's been 26 years ago. Never talked back to him once. Because... If you allow all of these noises in your head and people to determine what you should be, where would your life be? And so you've got to stand on the promises of all might. And these are real issues that we face. Right? There's people invite you to the bar, invite you, I don't drink. I don't care where I go, I don't drink. I don't smoke. Nobody's going to make me smoke and drink. Come on, man, you got to try this. I try nothing. You have a nice day. You can try that all by yourself, with yourself, and for yourself. All right? And the way I've always viewed myself, I always tell folks that me personally, I've learned to love myself. I could go in a restaurant and order a three-course meal and dessert all by myself. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm okay with that. I'd sit down and eat it and I'll have dessert on top of that. Chick. And when I finish, I say, good night. Have a good night. <laughs> all right? You've got to learn to love yourself, folks. Important. Any questions or comments? Right? A lot of times we hear biblical things, but it's how do we use it? How does it, you know, you, you did a good job of make, bringing the real world, to, real, um, excuse me, real world to the Bible. You did a good job at that. A lot of times we hear the word up here, and then we hit, then we get, then the, something happens, but we don't have the spirit gifts to part the, the sea. So it's like, how do you connect? So, he gave you a practical example. Somebody, you know, the Bible speaks of being sober-minded and health class teaches you why you shouldn't drink alcohol. When somebody comes up to you and says that, do you know how to respond? When people come up to you and tell you certain things, do you know how to respond? A lot of us don't respond, you know, correctly at all. We may come here every, you know, Sunday and put on a show, but everyone has messed up probably every single day leaving the church on Sunday. 
you know, that's why I said be transformed by the renewing of your minds and you're transformed by your studying. So when you get these tests, you know, hopefully you have brethren in your ecclesias where you're comfortable talking to. That's one of the most important things. I know um, Brother David reminded me, he said, you don't, you don't respond, man. You don't respond. And I'll be like, oh, man, I don't. You know what I mean? And I know Brother Philip said that on Sunday, too. Like, we try to do so many different things at once. Don't feel the type of way, I promise. We're not ignoring y'all. We're not. It's just when you do so many things at once, things just slip your mind. But they do have these brothers' classes. They do have these brothers' classes at 5 o'clock, you know, that um, they do speak about these things, you know. So when we, we do catch ourselves to find a little bit of time, that's the time where you... Go back into your WhatsApp group. I know we started a WhatsApp group and I saw somebody left the WhatsApp group. So he saw me come to your face and be like, yo, why'd you leave the group? <laughs> you saw that I did that. So it's also, it's also up to us older brethren to approach the people in this, uh, you know, the approach the younger ones that we consider as potential brothers or sisters. Or even when you see a, a brothers or sisters messing up, is that your thing? Is that your, is that your, is that, is, is, did God tell you to go up to that brother and just be happy that he's messing up. A lot of times we gotta humble ourselves too, as older brethren. When we see that we rise into another potential, are we bringing another brother up? Or are we happy that he's down here? Is that making, you know what I mean? So it's, a lot of times we gotta catch ourselves when we messing up too. We as older brethren, we gotta catch ourselves. I catch myself, what did I do wrong in this situation? All the time. So thank you, brother Nigel. For that and in the process of loving yourselves some people live their entire lives never figuring it out how you know and through god and through the scriptures we're able to have a lesson now it's up to us to interpret that lesson with our brothers and sisters to be able to handle the test properly right so with that i think we can close off there i think we got the lesson that was um what's supposed to be portrayed in Matthew 22, which was the reading for today. To close, we'll sing another songbook hymn, and this is called Count Your Blessings. And I took the interpretation for this song as in being rat. My words are not working today. Maybe it's the food. Maybe, maybe it's a lot. I'm falling asleep. But um, it's having gratitude for everything that you have in this life, the small things. All right, so please stand. One, two, three. When upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. So count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the day go by. So count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. When you look at others with your lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings money cannot buy. Is on earth with Jesus never more to die. Count your blessings, name them one by one. 
Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journeys. And so count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God have done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. At this time, I'd like to ask Brother David Corbin, if you will please close this youth hour with prayer. Let us pray. Our most gracious and ever loving Father, creator and sustainer of all things, we do hallow and glorify and praise thy name for this day which thou hast indeed given, that we may rejoice in it and be glad that we can be spiritually uplifted. We thank thee, Lord, that this has been thy will and it has been done according to the glorification of thy name. May these young ones that are put in our care be continue to be nurtured according to the admonition of thy laws. We pray most heavenly Father that may work upon their tender hearts and mind. We see what they're up against and in some circumstances, some situations, most heavenly Father, we know that they may not quite understand the evils that are out there in the world and that is why thou has placed them in our care and given them unto us that we can nurture them and turn them unto thee. And we ask, most heavenly Father, may you help us to be good stewards of that cause. And we pray that the words and the lessons that we have ministered before them this day may be understood and accepted by them. It may transform their lives. It may protect them from the evils in the world. We pray for their homes that they may be bastions of godliness, raising godly seed for the use in thy kingdom. We ask thy blessing upon the parents that thou may strengthen them, educate them, give them the fortitude of resilience according to that we see in faithful Abraham and Sarah, that they can command their children to be obedient to thy commandments, even as thou found in thy servant Abraham. We also look to the example of thy only begotten son, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who made thy business his business, thy work, his work, and doing thy will, his meat. May we can impress this upon the young ones by our actions, not only by words, that we can bring them along through this wilderness of evil and wickedness. And we help us most heavenly Father not to fail them, for thereby we will be failing thee. As we leave from here now, we ask that we may carry us safely to our homes, so may continue to provide for us the things that we need and protect us from our wants. We ask that it may bring us here safely tomorrow according to thy will to continue to serve and please thee and to be ever living examples and light in this world of darkness. These things we ask in and through the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. I'd like to thank everyone who participated in making this possible. I hope everyone have a wonderful rest of the day. Be safe. Hope to see you here to begin with time. 10.30, 10.30 sharp. We'll be starting. Hope to see you tomorrow. Take care.